biographical stories have a wonderful way of capturing the life of the person that they're describing. Great men and women, both famous and infamous, have had their stories told in the pages of a book. They tell us of their successes and accomplishments, but they also allow us to understand that many of their successes were obtained upon the back of their failures. You know, many great men and women of God have had their stories recorded also. St. Augustine, for instance, gave us one of the first and most revealing autobiographies in his Confessions. He opens his heart to us as he shares about the sordid life he lived before he experienced saving faith in Jesus Christ. William Carey was initially unsuccessful in convincing the leaders of his church about the need of a lost and dying world. But this humble shoemaker became known as the father of modern missions as he pioneered missionary work into India. Fanny Crosby lost her sight at the age of six, but through her life she was undaunted by life setbacks and published more than 2,000 hymns, many of which are still sung today. We hear about these godly people because they were able to overcome their failures and accomplish great things by the power of God. But how many of us never get away from a pattern of failure? Our Christian lives may just seem to be one failure after another. Well, today, that can all change, as Dr. McGee explains the success story of a failure. Dr. McGee first gave this sermon during his 21-year pastorate at the historic Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, may your word speak to each one listening, especially to those who are in a pattern of failure. In Jesus' name, amen. The subject of the morning is the success story of a failure. The success story of a failure. The greatest problem confronting the Christian is this. How to live the Christian life. All other problems are dissolved into this problem and all other problems sink into insignificance compared to this major problem, how to live the Christian life. Most sincere Christians, I'm confident, would confess today, I have not made a success of the Christian life. I admit failure on every hand. That has run down through the ages for the past 1900 years, I suppose, until today we accept failure as the norm of Christian living. It must be the way that you do it, is to continue to fail. May I say to you, God never intended for one of his children to be a failure in the Christian life. He's made other arrangements. There was a party that called me Friday night. Said, Pastor, I've lost my faith. I no longer believe in God. I've prayed. I have attempted to do certain things. And I want to say to you, it doesn't work. And with great bitterness of heart and soul, I listened to that story. May I say to you that that's not an extreme case, and it's not the exception today. I'm thankful it's not the average. I believe that there are multitudes of Christians today down deep in their hearts who long for a successful Christian life. I have read during the past few weeks several hundred letters of dedication. I've never been as moved in my own life as I have been by these letters. Then say it. And many of them expressed a longing and a deep desire to live for God. The fact of the matter is, it's those letters that have prompted the message of the morning. Now, if it's any comfort to you today, may I say that the greatest Christian who ever lived made a failure of the Christian life at first. I'm of the opinion that 
Many of us, as we look about us at other Christians and their failures, sometimes even wonder about their salvation. This little poem came to my attention the other day. I'd like to pass it on to you. I dreamed death came the other night, and heaven's gate swung wide. With kindly grace an angel came and ushered me inside. And there, to my astonishment, stood folks I'd known on earth, some I'd judged and called unfit, and some of little worth. Indignant words rose to my lips but never were set free. For every face showed stunned surprise, not one expected me. (laughs) Paul, in the seventh chapter of Romans, tells of his experience when he was a failure. A very brief period, I believe, but a period in which he acknowledged that he was a failure as a child of God. Romans 7 is Paul's personal experience. It opens with ye, know ye not brethren. He's talking to you. Then he adopts the editorial we, but before he concludes this chapter, he says, for that which I do. He's talking about himself. Now, Romans 7 has always been a chapter in the Bible that a great many have beat a detour around it. I wish that all believers could go through the seventh of Romans. The man who was losing the battle in the seventh of Romans won a victory in the eighth of Romans. And I think the way into the 8th of Romans is through the 7th of Romans. Paul is writing logically, so you can't take anything out and shift it somewhere else. He put it down just as the Holy Spirit of God gave it to him. But the 7th chapter of Romans tells the defeat of a child of God. Will you listen to this man? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, that's not the cry of an unsaved man. That's not a lost soul that's crying out. But that is the the cry of a saved man who's failed. He's desperate and frantic. And he's pushed the panic button, if you please. And he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In deepest despair, because of defeat, and because he's beaten as he's attempted to live for God. But don't think that Paul stayed there. That's not his life story by any means. That's only one period, because there came a day when he could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And when he came to the end of his life, he could write his own epitaph and say, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's a note of victory, my beloved. A man that has successfully lived the Christian life. Now, when you read that, you say, well, I'd like to know the modus operandi or the modus vivandi of a man that failed because I know something about failure And I'd like to know how he succeeded. May I put down this morning the steps that Paul puts down here in Romans? Five steps to a successful Christian life. Five steps that he gives us here. They're not arbitrary, but they, I do think, come in a logical sequence. May I mention the first one? 
The Christian must have an assurance of salvation. I'm more and more convinced that a child of God must have an assurance of salvation before he can live a successful Christian life. I believe that's the reason that the holiness movement never did produce very much holiness, is because of the fact it never gave any assurance of salvation. Now will you listen to a verse that I pick up in the third chapter of Romans, verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Paul says here, whom God, speaking of Christ, God has set forth Christ to be a propitiation, and the word is mercy seat, to be a mercy seat through faith in his blood, if you please. Now, to talk continually today about the blood of Christ, I do not think always indicates that you're fundamental. It may just mean that you're crude. Because the believer actually is not to see or to experience the blood at all. The blood is what God sees. And that's all important. God hath set forth the Lord Jesus to be a mercy seat. And who sees the blood? God sees the blood. Let me give you two illustrations. When the children of Israel were ready to leave the land of Egypt, that night with their loins girded, God said to each family, I want you to put the blood of that little lamb that you've roasted, I want that blood to be put outside on the doorposts and the lintels. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. He never said, every 30 minutes, if you run out and look, make sure it's there, it'll be all right. He said, you put the blood outside, you go inside, your loins girded. What a thrill there always is when you're getting ready to take a trip. I never have got used to it. May I say that you, you make your preparation. And that night, with their loins girded, they were marching out of the land of Egypt. And in the house they were eating their last meal, and they were rejoicing. Outside was the blood. God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Another illustration. God said to the children of Israel, I accept you as a nation on the Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. You bring in through your high priest, and I don't want him in there but once a year, and he cannot come in without blood. Once a year, he comes into the mercy seat. Oh, it's just the top of a box, highly ornamented, with two cherubim looking down upon it. But I want him to come in there. He's to bring a basin of blood from that lamb, that goat offered yonder on the altar, and he's to bring that in, and seven times he's to put that blood on that mercy seat. And God says, not one of you can come in there, not one of you are to be in there, when I see the blood, my beloved, God hath set forth Christ to be a mercy seat for us. Believers not to see it or to experience the blood, but that blood sprinkled on the mercy seat means that a holy and just and righteous God sees that blood and a sinner that he must condemn, a sinner that must be lost, God now accepts him and receives him, and God says, when I see the blood, I'm satisfied. Oh, I'm not good enough. He knows that. The reason Christ died. I'm going to try to do better. God says, don't do it. Come as you are. When I see the blood, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at the blood. The blood satisfies God. We need to have the assurance of our salvation. The blood of Jesus Christ alone can give us that. Now let me move on. The Christian, in the second place, must be knowledgeable. What is this? What do you mean by that? 
Well, I mean simply this, that he must know something. A child of God cannot be ignorant of the Word of God and live the Christian life. God has no way of doing that. And after all, that's the most practical thing in the world, isn't it? You do not buy any kind of a gadget today, but what instructions do not come with it. And God has given instructions for the Christian life. Over in Romans 6, will you listen to him? Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now we should have knowledge of a great truth, and until we know that truth, there's no possibility of living the Christian life. And it's this, after the sinner is saved, he makes a discovery, and this is a great discovery. His sins were dealt with properly when Christ died and shed his blood. And he finds out that his problem is no longer sins but self. Has that been your experience? That after you come to Christ and your sins have been forgiven, it's not a problem anymore of the sins, it's a problem of self. And we get in the way. The Bible calls it sin nature, flesh. The old man. Paul says, knowing that our old man is crucified with him. When he says old man, He's not using a beatnik term for your father. He's talking, if you please, about that old nature that you and I have. And it's sometimes called the body of this death. In fact, Paul cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the picture's rather vivid, Paul used. In the Roman Empire, when a man committed a murder, the way they punished that man was to take the, the body of the person he'd murdered and chain that body to him, face to face, arms to arms, legs to legs. And he carried that dead body with him while it was in that put state of putrefaction. He carried that body with him when he became a skeleton. And all his life he had that skeleton chained to him. Paul says, that's, that's my picture. After I came to Christ, wonderfully saved, I found out that that old nature was like a dead body chained to me. Has that been your experience as a child of God? If it is, it's a normal experience. The thing that's not normal is just to continually live with that old dead body. Now, the biggest problem for Christians is not sins, but self. Isn't that true? Oh, you say, I'm going to try to please God. Oh, I'm going to work at this. And you don't, do you? You say, I'm going to try to be humble. And you're not humble. I'm going to try to be loving, and you're not loving. And to compensate, you smile and act gracious. Oh, but down underneath, you're boiling. It's not sins, it's the sinner. And will you listen now to Paul? I go back to the fifth chapter of Romans Verse 12, I'm going to read verse 12. Listen to this. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Now, it doesn't mean each man's committed to sin. All have sinned in Adam. When Adam sinned, all of us sinned. Listen to him in verse 19 of the same chapter. 
For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And somebody says, well, I don't like that. Well, whether you like it or not, it's true. Adam's one act made us sinners. And somebody says, that ought not to work like that. May I say to you, it works that way in life. And will you permit me to use a very homely and personal illustration this morning? My grandfather, on my father's side, was Scotch-Irish, and he came from north of Ireland. And he came to Georgia, and he didn't like Georgia, apparently, and he moved to Mississippi, and he died in Texas. Now, will you look at that for just a moment? I didn't choose the name McGee. I got it from him. And I came to America in my grandfather. Why, if he'd stayed in North Ireland, I'd be back there. Today, I guess somebody said, I wonder why I didn't stay. <laughs> and I would be speaking with that accent over there instead of a lovely Texas bro. But you see, he came, he came to America. And when he came to America, I came to America. And if he hadn't come to America, I'd never be here. I'm in my grandfather. What he did, I did. Whether you like it or not, that's true of you also. All of you are here today because you had an ancestor in some other country that said, I'm going to America, and you came. Now, somebody's going to say, there's some Indians here this morning, and they're Native Americans. They only got here few hundred years ahead of us, they came over the other way. They came the northern route. But they came. And that's the way we got here today. We came here through somebody else. One day my grandfather said to my grandmother, we're going to the new country. He got on a ship. He came to Georgia and to Mississippi and to Texas. And, and I was born there. I made no choice of that whatsoever. May I say to you today, what Adam did, I did. And the only way out of this family of Adam in which sin has come is to die. And that's the only way you can get out of any family is to die. You've got to die if you're going to get out of the family. Oh, I could change the name, but it wouldn't change the fella. And in Adam's family, you have to die. But will you listen to this? Know ye not that so many of us, as were identified with Christ, we were identified in his death? I want to say to you this morning that I died. Died in Christ 1,900 years ago. When did we die? That, and my friend, that's the crucified lie. Is to know that 1,900 years ago when Christ died, we died in Christ. We died in him. You know, it's an interesting thing. That Galatians 2.20 has been used so much today in consecration. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. When were you crucified with Christ? 1900 years ago when he was crucified. A great many people talk today about self-crucifixion. 
And the interesting thing is that if you could crucify yourself, you'd be committing suicide. And the and you can uh, you can commit suicide by taking poison. You can commit suicide putting a gun to your head. You can commit suicide by hanging. I saw in the paper last night a man here in Linwood in a motel hanged himself. But you cannot crucify yourself. That's one way you can't kill yourself. I said to a young man when I first came here to Churchill North, he came down one of these pale-faced fellows. Always those are the fellows that are living the crucified life. Looked like he needed vitamins. He looked like a fugitive from a blood bank as he came down. And he came down and he said, he said to, to me, are you living the crucified life? And I said to him, no, are you? He says, I'm trying it. Well, I said, that's not what you asked me. Are you living the crucified life? And he tried to shake his head that he was. And I said, you mean you crucify yourself? He said, yes. I said, I, I just dare you to do it. Well, I said, I can't crucify myself. If I nail, suppose I nail one hand to the cross, who's going to nail that hand? Suppose I do learn to use one foot to do it. Well, may I say to you, I end up with one foot that's not nailed. You can't crucify yourself, my friend. And that's an interesting thing. But our Lord died by crucifixion. He had to die at the hands of others. And when he died, we died. And that is something you have to know to live the Christian life. Oh, I must move on this morning. The third, the Christian must have confidence in God. Will you listen to verse 11 of chapter 6 of Romans? Likewise, reckon ye, all, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I recognize this to be the most difficult step, and the reason is most Christians treat it as being theoretical. Oh, I know many of us have tried this. How many times we have sat down with the Word of God, and we have said, Lord, I reckon, I reckon myself to be dead. You said it, I reckon it. And then you go out and make a cutting remark to somebody, or you whisper some gossip, and then you come back and say, well, boy, I thought I crucified him. I thought I reckoned him dead, and the old boy was more alive than I've seen him in a long time. What happened? May I say to you today that the Holy Spirit will have to make that real to us. And it's when you and I have confidence in God. For this word reckon, it has with it not a theoretical meaning at all, a very practical meaning. It goes into the business world. Before I was saved, I worked on a savings window in a bank. I never shall forget one day a poor woman, ignorant, she had to make a cross mark for her signature. She came up and said, I want to draw out my money. She had a little over $200 in the savings. She says, I want it in $1 bills. And I got her whatever the amount was and had her make her little cross and had it witnessed and took the passbook and pitched it back to the bookkeeper and saw her go out to the desk. And she began to take those $1 bills and start counting them. And she got them all mussed up. Oh, my banks, you've just got to have them just right in the bank. But she had them all out all over that table. And I went to lunch. And I came back, and she was still out there counting. In about three hours, she came back. Instead of having a nice little stack of $1 bills, she had a box of them now. She said, I want to put them back in the bank. Well, I want to tell you that was an irritating thing. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, why in the world did you take it out in the first place? She says, I had been told that this bank didn't have the money. And I didn't know whether you still had my $200 or not, so I came down here to get it and count it, make sure you still had it. 
And that's all she'd done. May I say that since then I thought about that poor, ignorant woman who had to count the money. She just couldn't have a pass book and reckon on it. How many Christians today, they just don't reckon on it. It's not real. It's not real to them. May I say to you, God wants us to reckon on these things. And this is the thing that, that he emphasizes. Oh, he says, reckon yourself to be dead under sin. Therefore, that means we're to walk by faith. Simon Peter did walk on the water. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus Christ, and the minute he took his eyes off of Christ, began to look at his circumstances and look at Simon Peter, he started in under. And many of us today, oh, we have started out so well walking by faith, but before long we saw our circumstances and we looked at ourselves and our own little experience and we began to sink. My friend, we have to keep our eye on Jesus Christ. We have to reckon we died with him and we've been raised with him. I must move on. The fourth thing, a Christian must present himself to God. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, this is true consecration. Yield is the word present yourself. And he does not mean the consecration or the yielding of the old nature. Oh, how many times consecration to us meant we just brought our old nature. I say to you today, God doesn't want it. And to make it very vivid, may I say this? To bring our old nature and offer it to God is like taking the contents of a garbage can and offering it to God for an offering. He doesn't want it. He can't use it. Consecration is, as he says here, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And this is what I mean. These members of our bodies are called the flesh. And the reason it's called the flesh is because the old nature's used them so long. We've set up, psychologists tell us today, that we've set up certain synaptical connections through axon and dendrite, going up from one nerve center to another nerve center, and it creates a habit. And habits are difficult to break. That old natures control this body. Now a new nature's come in. Now he says the thing that you're to do is to bring your members and the members of your body. What is it you're having trouble with today? A tongue? Bring it to God. What are you having trouble with? Your eyes? Bring them to God. Hands? Bring them to God. What is it you're having trouble with? Offer your members to God. You've been given a new nature, your new creation. And this new nature is to control now the members of the body. And you are to offer them to God. Augustine was a profligate in North Africa. Dissipated. Young man. A drunkard. After his conversion, his wonderful mother, Monica, prayed for him for years. And this young man, a brilliant young man, a philosophy professor, finally converted and brought to Christ. And one day on the street, he met a woman, a woman that he had known before, and he started to go by her. And she stopped and turned and said to him, Augustine, it's I. He kept on going, and she started following him, and she says, Augustine, it's I. He turned around finally and said to her, it's not I. These eyes that once looked at you with lust are not mine anymore. They belong to Christ. 
These hands that have held you, they're not mine anymore. They belong to Christ. I belong to Him. Not until you and I start doing that, my beloved, will we be able to live for God. Jesus Christ has to take over. Members of the body. I come to the last, briefly now. A Christian must walk in the Spirit. Each one of these merits a sermon we've talked about today, but I wanted to cover this ground. Must walk in the Spirit. And the reason for that is, Paul said two tremendous things in Romans 7, 18. First, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And then he said, For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul found out that though all these other things might be true in your life, you still wouldn't live the Christian life. Because he found out that though he had a new nature, there was no power in that new nature. The will, he said, is present with me, but I just don't seem to, I don't seem to be able to do it. And then he found out that the Holy Spirit has come in to the heart and life to bring power and to bring the life of Christ. May I put it this way? God never asked you to live the Christian life, and furthermore, you cannot live the Christian life. A great many people say today, oh, I'm so weak. That's not your trouble. You're too strong. You're trying to do it yourself. He never asked you to do it. Will you listen to him? There came a day when Paul said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I have found a way. I have found a way. And that way is not through Paul. It's not through him at all. It's only when he steps aside and Christ steps in by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Oh, if we've had a good day and... Our feelings didn't get ruffled, and we come to the end of it, and we say, oh, we, we, we're a success today. But if we've had a bad day, and somebody steps on our toes, and we hit back, and we said ugly things, we say, oh, I'm a, such a failure. May I say to you, we're a failure both days. Satan will never try to get you, if you're a child of God, to murder. Although sometimes in this traffic, you feel like it, don't you? But you won't. If you're a child of God, he's not trying to get you to murder. Do you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get you and me to trust ourselves. He's trying to make us believe we can do it, and we can't do it. We just can't do it, my beloved. Somebody says, oh, I, I hope to be better. If that's what you're saying... It's to fail to see yourself in Christ only. Oh, you say, I'm disappointed with myself. Well, my beloved, that means then you did believe in yourself after all, didn't you? And then somebody says, I'm so discouraged. If you are, that's unbelief. That's unbelief. And somebody says today, though, I'm a member of COD, and I do this and I do that, I'm a pretty proud of my life. If you are, you're blind. We have no standing before God in ourselves. It's only in Christ. And the Christian life is Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It means to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is Christ. Paul said that, for me to live is Christ. And we keep majoring on this business, to die is gain. If for me to live is Christ. Anything that Vernon McGee produces is of the flesh, and it's ugly and not acceptable to God. It's only when the Spirit of God moves through us. 
Somebody says today, oh, I need patience. May I, I don't want to be unkind, but you don't need patience. Somebody says, but I need wisdom. You don't need wisdom. Somebody says, but I'm in sorrow. I need comfort. You don't need comfort. Somebody says, oh, it's so difficult to face life. I need courage. You don't need courage. My friend, what you need is Christ. We are looking for the byproducts and we're not looking for reality. It's only as we lay hold of Him. We uh, walk not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And that walk is not a sensational walk. It's not an explosive sort of thing. It's not an experience that carries you to the heights. It's an experience that takes you out yonder and enables you to stand at the workbench, or at the sink, or at school, and live for God. Just a prosaic walk, but a walk in the Spirit. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. Life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not I, but Christ. Paul found the secret. I trust that you will find the secret. Life can be difficult at times, but without a Savior, it's impossible to overcome the great weight of sin that we all struggle with. Only by believing and receiving God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ can we be freed by sin that entangles our lives. If you'd like to know more about God's gift of salvation to you, then we'd love to send you some helpful information in the form of our salvation packet. To receive yours, you can contact us anytime at 1-800-65-BIBLE and leave your request along with your name, address, and the call letters of this station. One of the first steps that Dr. McGee mentioned for success is to have the assurance of your salvation. If you're struggling with the issue of assurance, we'd like to let you know that we have a booklet by Dr. McGee called How You Can Have the Assurance of Salvation. For ordering information on this booklet or a cassette copy or CD of today's sermon called The Success Story of a Failure, just contact one of our service operators at 1-800-652-4253. Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. We're continuing Dr. McGee's dynamic study through the wonderful epistle to the Romans, and you can hear him on the Through the Bible radio program every Monday through Friday on this station. For those of you who know that you'll benefit from Dr. McGee's notes and outlines, we invite you to be added to our mailing list. To do so, contact us anytime by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE, using our Internet order form, or downloading them from our website at ttb.org. And, of course, you can always write to Sunday Sermon in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now we pray that God will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace every moment of every day. Jesus, take it home, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. Be washed in my This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.